Go watch Paul Bernardo being interviewed by policemen on, on YouTube. That's bloody, it, that's enlightening, man. If you've been watching my videos or have read my book, The Devil and His Do, you'll know that I've been building a case against Jordan Peterson in part by offering into evidence examples of him praising and defending Adolf Hitler and other Nazis while ignoring, glossing over, and even reveling in the demise of their Jewish victims. Peterson takes a similar approach when discussing serial killers. For instance, Paul Bernardo. Now, if you're not Canadian, it's unlikely you've heard of Paul Bernardo, so let me provide you with an overview. But before I do that, I must warn you, for educational purposes, this video contains graphic descriptions. Paul Bernardo is Canada's most notorious serial rapist and serial murderer. During his trial in the early 1990s, he became a household name, and his crime spree is somewhat comparable to that of Ted Bundy. Before Bernardo's identity became known, the press referred to him as the Scarborough Rapist, Scarborough being a district of Toronto, and his activities as a reign of terror. Bernardo used to cruise around in his car looking for young women, usually teenagers, to assault and rape, often at knife point. He was a fearless predator. He would stalk, charge, and tackle girls in broad daylight and rape them in the bushes, or he would appear at their parents' homes and rape them in their backyards. He would also abduct them, as he did with 14-year-old Leslie Mahaffey, who he tortured, beat, and raped for two days. Bernardo videotaped Mahaffey's ordeal, but turned off the camera just before ending her life by strangling her with an electrical cord. Two days later, he cut her corpse into ten pieces, put the pieces in concrete, and dumped the concrete in a lake. A similar fate befell 15-year-old Kristen French, who Bernardo abducted just after she got out of school. Once more, he videotaped himself beating and raping the girl, and showed her the video of him beating and raping Leslie Mahaffey, telling her that what happened to Mahaffey was going to happen to her. French probably understood what that meant, because Mahaffey's remains had been discovered, and news of her abduction and murder made public. Paul Bernardo strangled Kristen French to death with his favorite electrical cord, whereupon her hair was cut off, and Bernardo put her naked corpse in his car so he could drive it to a cemetery and place it on top of Leslie Mahaffey's grave. However, at the cemetery, he couldn't locate the grave, so he dumped Kristen French's body next to the road leading to the cemetery. Paul Bernardo also participated in the rape and murder of 15-year-old Tammy Homolka, sister of Bernardo's then-girlfriend and future wife, Carla Homolka, who also partook in Tammy's rape and murder. This occurred on Christmas Eve in Carla's and Tammy's basement as their parents slept upstairs. Paul Bernardo committed three murders, at least 14 rapes, and six attempted rapes. He received a life sentence, which in Canada means a minimum of 25 years. After 25 years, convicts can apply for parole, but since Bernardo is classified as a dangerous offender, he will almost certainly never get parole. Now, let's watch Jordan Peterson giving an undergraduate psychology lecture at the University of Toronto about Walt Disney's Pinocchio, during which he proposes that since the citizens of Nazi Germany believed Hitler to be a savior, it was only natural for Hitler to act as their savior. In 1923, Hitler compared himself to Christ the savior. You see, he was going to deliver his kin from evil, that is, the Jews. In other words, how could Hitler resist doing all the, you know, stuff that he did, given that people egged him on? His unspecified activities weren't his fault, they were everyone's fault. Peterson also diverges from the Disney flick to discuss psychopaths and Paul Bernardo, who he says is psychopathic and narcissistic. In my book, I argue that Jordan Peterson is psychopathic and narcissistic. So anyways, they're walking down the street and the the uh, fox is bragging away about some crooked thing that he's done and how he pulled the wool over someone's eyes. And he confuses that with uh, wisdom and intelligence. And one of the things that you see, this is worth knowing too, because if you're preyed upon by a psychopath, which you will be to some degree at some point in your life, the psychopath, who will be narcissistic, will presume that you're stupid and, and, and that you deserve to be taken advantage of because you're naive and stupid. So it's actually a good thing that he's doing it. And uh, he, his proof for, and I'm saying he because there are more male psychopaths, um, the, uh, the proof that you're stupid naive is that he can take advantage of you. And so, like, if you were wiser, you'd, you'd be, you know, you'd, you'd know his tricks. And 
then it wouldn't be morally necessary for him to show you just exactly who knows what about what. And so the psychopath will use his ability to, to fool you as proof of his own grandiose, grandiose omnipotence, omniscience, and narcissism. And the problem with that is that you, you can be fooled by a psychopath, and virtually anybody can. You can be fooled by a psychopath. Virtually anybody can, he says, gesturing toward his students. As I've said in other videos, Peterson is forever fooling people. He's always playing a joke or trick on his listeners. The gag here is, not only can his students be fooled by a psychopath, they are being fooled by a psychopath. The psychopath who's telling them that they can be fooled by a psychopath. He's describing himself, yet his students would probably never realize that, proving to Peterson that they're none too perceptive which furthers his grandiosity, or sense of superiority, a hallmark feature of narcissistic personality disorder. Superiority, nay, feelings of invincibility, is the drug that narcissists crave, and to get their fix, they must con and play their scheming games as often as possible. This helps mitigate feelings of worthlessness, which materialize when the narcissist has no one to fool. When this occurs, the narcissist can spiral into depression, perchance with the realization that they're not hyper-intelligent and unstoppable, but demented and pathetic. Jordan Peterson requires constant narcissistic supply, that is, people he can trick. As he sees it, human beings are just objects to be manipulated and lied to. Millions of objects have lined up and paid money to be manipulated and lied to. Yet if you point this out to them, they dig in and defend Peterson, who they tend to view as a father figure or savior. Thus, the manipulation continues, and the adherents become even more loyal to Peterson. Put plainly, he's the leader of a cult. So that Robert Hare, for example, who studied psychopaths for a long time, and interviewed a lot of them, like hundreds of them, and videotaped many of the interviews, he said when he was talking to the psychopath, he always believed what they were saying. And then he'd watch the video afterwards and see where the conversation went off the rails. But, you know, the, pro bro the proclivity to be polite in a conversation is very strong. And if you're polite, you don't object to the way that the person unfolds their strategy, you know. And psychopaths are pretty good at figuring out how to manipulate, obviously, how to manipulate people. And the probability that you will be immune to that is extraordinarily low. Go watch Paul Bernardo being interviewed by policemen on, on the YouTube. Observe how he doesn't say that Bernardo is terribly manipulative but rather good at manipulation. Bernardo is a psychopath with talent. I have never heard Peterson suggest to his students that they read a book on, say, logic or critical literacy, which could protect them from being manipulated by speech, nor have I ever heard him recommend a book or even a journal article about psychology, which is what he teaches. However, he has recurrently directed his students to videos and reading matter that are about or created by mass murderers and serial killers. For example, in what seemed like every second or third interview Peterson did in the summer of 2018, he excitedly suggested that people read Hitler's table talk, branding it amazing. He meant that what Hitler said was amazing, and he informed Joe Rogan that Hitler was satanically possessed. Peterson's favorite novel, which he also recommends, is Crime and Punishment, by Fyodor Dostoevsky. The protagonist, Raskolnikov, is a handsome student and an agitated paranoiac and compulsive liar. He fantasizes about offing his landlady, to whom he owes money. He bludgeons her to death with an axe before doing in her sister. Later, we learn that this is what Satan told him to do. Recall how Peterson said Hitler was satanically possessed. He said the same of Stalin and Mao. You might be interested to know that Dostoevsky was heralded by the Nazis in a propaganda pamphlet called Bolshevism from Moses to Lenin, which Peterson has almost certainly read because he has lectured about other Nazi propaganda pamphlets, as you would in an undergraduate psych class. In Bolshevism from Moses to Lenin, Hitler's mentor, Dietrich Eckhart, says to Hitler, in what is probably a fictionalized discussion, that Dostoevsky questioned what would happen in Russia if Russian Jews ever got the upper hand. Hitler replies, Ah, could our workers but share this foreboding, particularly those who hope for salvation from the Soviets? Indeed, in A Writer's Diary, Dostoevsky floats the paranoid notion that Russia's Jews might exterminate Russia's non-Jews en route to world domination. 
He says the Jews were awaiting the Messiah, all of them, from the very lowest kike to the highest and most learned rabbi Kabbalist. They all believe that the Messiah will again unite them in Jerusalem and bring by his sword all nations to their feet. In Crime and Punishment, the landlady is described as being dirty, with sharp malignant eyes and a little sharp nose. Dostoevsky, the anti-Semite, also tells us that she's as rich as a Jew. In another U of T lecture, Peterson characterized the landlady as horrible, reprehensible, and miserable. He depicted her killer as smart. Anyway, so old Raskolnikov, he thinks he's a pretty educated guy, and he's pretty smart, and he is pretty smart, but he's like smart arrogant, not smart wise. Because he's 21, what the hell does he know? He doesn't know anything, but he's smart. And he's contemptuous of other people because he can probably be smarter than most of them, you know, and he confuses that with, with knowing what's going on. And so he lives in this little horrible apartment and he has a horrible landlady. And she really, like, this is where Dostoevsky's a genius. Like, Raskolnikov hates his landlady. And then Dostoevsky tells you why. And you'd think, well, yeah, I'd hate her too. So she's miserable. So anyways, Raskolnikov is thinking about these things, and he's thinking, well, I could be a lawyer, and I'd be a good one. I'd help people. I'd help the poor people, you know, and, and what the hell good is it for me to wander around starving like this? And it doesn't seem reasonable, and, and my sister's going to go basically prostitute herself for this rich guy, and that sucks. And, like, there's my landlady, and she's an absolutely reprehensible creature, and everyone agrees, and she's old and worn out, and it's like, and she has this person she keeps as a slave. Oh, maybe I should just get rid of her. And what I love about that is that, like... What he loves about it is, a handsome, mentally ill, white male, who believed he was receiving instructions from Lucifer, brutally murdered a woman who, if not a Jew, was like a Jew. And the author of this story was lauded by the Nazis for his Judeophobia. Peterson even told his students that they could identify with the murderer. And you guys could identify with Raskolnikov to some degree. And there you have it. Murder victim bad, murderer good. To be certain, Peterson has made his obsession with serial killers and sex offenders glaringly apparent. He has spoken or written about Ted Bundy, John Wayne Gacy, Charles Whitman, better known as the University of Texas Tower shooter, James Holmes, who killed and wounded people in a movie theater in Colorado, Adam Lanza, responsible for the Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting, and Ted Kaczynski, better known as the Unabomber. Indeed, while teaching at Harvard in 1996, Peterson said he understood how Kaczynski thought, explaining that Kaczynski had no trouble maiming and murdering innocent people because he believed himself to be superior to everyone, which is what he said about Raskolnikov. Peterson has also sympathized with and heaped praise on serial killers and serial rapists. For example, Carl Panzram, whose mugshots grace Peterson's book, Twelve Rules for Life, at the beginning of a chapter mostly about murderers. The Columbine Killers, one of whom Peterson cites in Twelve Rules for Life. Here is the professor giving a TEDx talk and showing a picture of the Columbine Killers during their murder spree. And Alec Manassian, who used a rented van in Toronto to kill 11 people and injure 15. Here's what Peterson said about Manassian. He was angry at God because women were rejecting him. The cure for that is enforced monogamy. That's actually why monogamy emerges. This is not a one-off. Peterson has habitually praised, defended, sympathized with, and identified with serial killers, just as he has with Adolf Hitler and other Nazis. Returning to the Pinocchio lecture, you may recall that prior to bringing up Paul Bernardo, he mentioned Robert Hare who he claimed always believed psychopaths until he reviewed the video of their talks. Robert Hare developed the Hare Psychopathy Checklist, used by law enforcement agencies to gauge whether suspects are psychopaths. Hare does consulting for the FBI's Child Abduction and Serial Murder Investigative Resources Center. Paul Bernardo was evaluated using the Hare Checklist and scored 35 out of 40, indicating he was a clinical psychopath. Indeed, psychologists concluded that Bernardo met the criteria for narcissistic personality disorder and psychopathy, meaning he was more likely to repeat violent sexual offending. This is something Peterson would understand, because he understands Bernardo exceedingly well. You see, Peterson really gets sex criminals. In fact, sex criminal is a component of his personality. He said so himself. 
If you start to understand who you are, then you understand the Nazis. And who wants to understand the Nazis? You know, I can understand mm. sex criminals. I can understand them. Right. right. I can understand Nazis. And the reason for that is because I can see that as an aspect of myself. Truly. Be aware that Peterson has admitted to being accused of sexual misconduct by four women, three of whom he encountered in his workplace, suggesting they were either colleagues or students, and one was a client. Here's what he said about the allegations from his workplace. You know, I've been accused three times in my career of sexual impropriety, baseless accusations, and the last one really tangled me up for a whole year, so there's plenty to be sorted out. But like I said already, we live in the delusion of a 13-year-old adolescent girl. And so, as long as we maintain that level of sophistication, we're not going to have a real conversation about what rules should govern men and women in the workplace. So you can't even open the damn discussion without being jumped on by, uh, you know, a uh, array of, like, rabid harpies. Right, so if we discuss sexual harassment, women will attack us. When Peterson's critics hear him say things like this, they tend to ask questions like, what's he talking about? But a better question would be, who's he talking to? Regarding the client who brought accusations against Peterson, he mentioned this to Joe Rogan, after which he and Joe had a good laugh. And my clinical practice was threatened because of a vindictive client who came after me with a pack of lies, but because they were so... And basically, I emerged from that unscathed, but that was by no means obvious that that was going to be the case. I was accused of sexual misconduct. And the evidence? When I was dealing with this client, I would turn my wedding ring around. You'd spin it? Well, i play with it. Right. And that well, was her, sexual misconduct? Yeah, well, to her it was a signal of some dark underlying desire that I wasn't that was polluting our therapeutic relationship. I've been doing that with you the whole conversation. I yeah. Reach, I have this uh, silicone wedding ring. Yeah, well, I'd I'm going to report. I'd report you if you had. finger in there. I, I'd, uh, yeah, exactly. I do that That's, all the time. Yes, well, there you bad? go. It's, it's really bad. And if there was a college that governed the behavior of reprobates like you, I would definitely report. No, don't I do, do that. That's I do terrible. This. I stretch it out. No, that's uh, <laughs> Freudian to the extreme. Although I don't know what turning it means. How could this stretching a silicone wedding band be Freudian? Well, you're putting your finger in the little it's hole. rubber. Making Fuck the, kind of vaginas yeah, well, rubber, you're dealing rubber, with. Rubber is, you know, that's good. No, those are not teenagers. Rogan is 54 and Peterson is 59. Whether the College of Psychologists of Ontario investigated frivolous claims concerning sexual misconduct, I don't know. But I do know that Peterson lies a lot, and that he despises women, which he makes clear whenever he flies into a rage about female kindergarten teachers or women's studies programs. He prefers men, like Paul Bernardo, who he understands. Let's return to the Pinocchio lecture being given by a professor who views himself in part as a sex criminal and Nazi, saying nice things about Canada's most notorious sex criminal and serial murderer. If you're up for a challenge, try counting the number of times Peterson lavishes Bernardo with praise. I'll only interrupt once. That's bloody... It, that's enlightening, man. Paul Bernardo, he's like the CEO of a meeting in that video, you know? He gives the cops hell, he gives the lawyers hell, he protests his innocence. He basically tells them that they're rude and untrustworthy because they don't trust him because he did a few little things 17 years ago. And he gets away with it a few little things, right? I mean, he killed a bunch of people, including the sister of his girlfriend at the time. And, you know, he was a repeat sexual offender and murderer. It's like, but he basically goes, well, you know, that's a long time ago. It's like, we're, we're past that, aren't we? I mean, I'm having a discussion with you. I'm trying to solve, help you solve some crimes, which, by the way, I committed, but we won't bring that up. Now that was funny. Bar closes at 11. Don't forget to tip your server. Here's what helps make Peterson's joke so comical. Before Leslie Mahaffey was strangled to death and cut up into bits, prior to Paul Bernardo's joking about how light her head felt once he had severed it from her body, she begged for her life. Comedy gold. No? And to make Peterson's stand-up bit even funnier, he encouraged his learners to share in the humor. This, just after he told them they could be fooled by a psychopath. Get ready to keep counting. You know, and you're, 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 you're accusing me of being a liar. Like, you're not playing fair. What, what's up with you? And then when they answer, he looks at his fingernails, which is like, that's a lovely little manipulative thing, because it basically means, 
Whatever happens to be under my fingernail at the moment is much higher priority than listening to your foolish story. And you watch, you'll see people do that to you. And then you get a little insight into what they're up to. He's very good at that. And so, or he looks outside, or he, or, or he just looks at his hands, or he looks out the window, immediately dismissive in his nonverbal behavior. It's brilliant. The, the, the courts were forced to release that, by the way. But look it up, Paul Bernardo on YouTube. Wow, it's, it's just mind-boggling. He's so good at what he does. And he's good-looking, and he's charismatic, and you know, he can really pull it off. And, you can't tell what's happening with the cops and the lawyers, whether they're just letting him play his routine to get some information from him, or whether he's actually setting them back on his heels. And I suspect it's a bit of both, but uh, it's a masterful performance. If you didn't know who he was, and you were watching it without the audio, you'd think he's the CEO of some company giving his employees hell for not being up to scratch. That's all his body language, his eye contact, everything just speaks that. It's amazing. So anyways, you got these two-bit hoods here who think they're really something. They also think they're tough and dangerous, and, and they're not. By my count, within a clip spanning 1 minute and 55 seconds, Jordan Peterson praised Paul Bernardo 20 times, or once every 5.8 seconds. Now, let's watch extracts from the Bernardo interview that got Peterson so excited. Know that Bernardo was convicted in 1995, but this interrogation happened in 2007, mostly to try and ascertain whether he killed a fourth young woman named Elizabeth Bain. In 2006, Bernardo confessed to 10 additional sexual assaults, which occurred prior to the time he was known as the Scarborough Rapist. However, at the time of this interview, the police hadn't verified whether Bernardo's confessions were true. The video will begin with Bernardo accusing the police of accusing him of being a crazy liar. They can bring in all the facts to show just where I lied then, if I'm a liar. That's what I say to do, because I either I'm a liar or I'm not a liar, and I'm not a liar. But you guys are trying to paint me as one. The public, according to the public, they, they turned on the TV in September of last year, and I was this crazy liar. Uh, that's what the TV reported, and not only did they report it there, they wrote it on my file. I've got it right myself. Paul Bernardo, uh, Peel Regional said Paul Bernardo lied to police about uh, crimes he didn't commit, said he did. Okay. I, I mean, this is, this, that's just awful. I mean, come on. Okay. Enough manipulation, you know what I mean? Either you tell the truth or don't, otherwise the whole purpose of any interview is just stupid. Because if I'm this crazy liar, I'll be just sitting here lying to you about everything, right? Right? I mean, why wouldn't I? I'm just this crazy liar. I'm a human being, and, and, and to say that I'm a dangerous offender and raping and killing and all this stuff, it's fine. I mean, for public video, you know, get that, you know, tough on crime, get that bad guy. But, but when you go to a certain point of line, it just, I mean, it affects me totally. You know, I made mistakes, I made mistakes a long time ago. But don't say that today about me, because then we're lying and then we got a big problem because I'm looking at you and you're the bad guys, because I'm not doing anything wrong. I'm not telling the truth and you guys are walking around issuing statements that I lied here, I lied there. In the following segment, you will see the investigator asking Bernardo if he killed Elizabeth Bain, who was a 22-year-old student at the University of Toronto, the same institute where it seems three women accused Peterson of sexual misconduct. Did you kill Elizabeth Bain on June the 19th, 1990? Well, it's a loaded question. I mean, are we going to go back and, 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 and go through the, the time sequence of what happened in my life? I mean, I, I could just give a yes or no answer, but, you know, there's a lot of issues about that. Right. You know, the, the Carlos and my rule, who did what, where, when, this is why I said, did you guys, you know, go down there to get a polygraph to get, to see if she was telling the truth? Like, why didn't Bevan do it in the first place? I mean, he's polygraphing everyone with a Camaro. Why would he make a deal with someone and not give them a polygraph? It, it, it's not incomprehensible to me. Uh, you know, because now I'm sitting, my file says her version, and it's a lie. <laughs> you know, I, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I, I, you know, I'm not making frivolous points here. I mean, and now you're asking me, after you, after you said Peel Regional said I'm lying about this, and then you're saying I'm lying about my profile, you're saying I'm lying if I'm better or not. Now you're saying, hey, did you kill this person? I mean, well, you're saying I'm lying here, here, and here. I could say, no, I didn't. Uh, but, I mean, you already said I'm lying here with the P.O. you're saying. Okay. I'm, not saying I'm not saying anything no, but about who's lying. I've uh, done investigation on information that you've told me, and, and as a result of that information, I've been able to... Uh, verify in my mind where you told me the truth. So if Peel Region is lying about you or someone else is lying about you, I have no control over that or no... It goes right to credibility. Well, absolutely it does. And that's, I guess, the, the easy way that is to, if we can go through, we'll answer the questions. And yes, I hope to be able to go through some timeline to identify where you were, what you were doing specifically 
in relation to this this case. Anyways, I know I'm giving you guys a hard time behind the argument about certain things, but I mean, really, I'm a human being, and when you guys do all these things, I, I've got to, anyways, I'll try and truncate it a little bit more, but anyways, the answer to that is, is no, but the 800-pound gorilla in the room is, that's a life 25 sentence, you know? It really comes down to credibility, right. and, and not only credibility, but then again, timeline, I mean, between what Carlos and my roles were, respectively, and this and that. The answer is no to that question. Quite a joker, eh? Giving the police the runaround regarding the murder of a young woman who disappeared after she drove to the University of Toronto to attend an evening class. When her car was discovered, its interior was covered in blood. No wonder Peterson called Bernardo's responses a masterful performance. In the Pinocchio lecture, as touched on, Peterson discussed the rise of Adolf Hitler. He used the related footage for his documentary, The Rise of Jordan Peterson, staggering video of him explaining how Hitler influenced the Germans with a film of Hitler speaking at rallies. Peterson began by saying, I spent a lot of time thinking about Hitler and I was thinking, well, how do you get into a state like that, you know? What he means is, how do you recreate a state like that? What techniques can you use to encourage people to support you in a fascist coup d'etat? In the next clip, he will theorize that Hitler and the Germans conspired to achieve malevolent ends. Simultaneously, he will describe the tactics he employs during his public speeches. They had a conspiracy together and went down a bad path. Now, think about it this way. The crowd's not happy and neither are you, and there's reason for it. And so you start talking to them. You don't know what you're upset about, and neither does the crowd. So you start to articulate some things about why you might be upset. And some of them fall flat, but you're paying attention to the crowd. And some of the things make the crowd really wake up and listen. And so you start saying more of those things. But it's not like you're sitting there saying, although you might be, I'm going to tell this crowd more what it wants to hear. It's more sophisticated than that. And so you do that a thousand times. And you do that to ever-increasing crowds. And the crowd really starts to go mad. And they basically tell you that you're the savior of the nation. It's like, at what? how many bloody people have to tell you that before you start to believe it. That Peterson spoke about Bernardo and Hitler in the same lecture is no coincidence. In Peterson's mind, they go together. When he talks about Hitler, he often mentions Karl Panzram, a German-American, and the Columbine killers, one of whom, Eric Harris, was an avowed, zigheil-giving neo-Nazi. Indeed, in 12 Rules for Life, Peterson quotes Harris making references to the Nazis and the final solution. Do you remember this PowerPoint slide from the TEDx talk where Peterson showed a photo of the Columbine killers? Here's a slide he showed three minutes earlier of Hitler as a knight in shining armor. Hitler was a hero, Peterson likes to tell us, by boasting about the medal he won in World War I for heroism. The Columbine killers were also heroes, as were Karl Panzram and Paul Bernardo. Why? They were murderers, but more specifically, they murdered children. I do not make such a claim lightly, and it is abundantly supported by the evidence I include in The Devil and His Due, How Jordan Peterson Plagiarizes Adolf Hitler. For instance, I illustrate how Peterson tends to describe serial killers using language that is similar to, or the same as, language he uses to describe Hitler. Allow me to show you a sample of what I mean. Let's compare Peterson talking about Bernardo and Hitler. In the blue statements, he's talking about Bernardo. And in the white statements, he's talking about Hitler. Blue for Bernardo, white for Hitler. And we'll start with Bernardo first. He's very good at that. Hitler appealed to the darkest fantasies of the crowd, and he was really good at it. He's just so good at what he does. One thing Hitler was good at was order. He can really pull it off. Nietzsche's overman was a concept the Nazis pulled off. Hitler didn't have quite as long a time as Mao to pull his stunts off. It's brilliant. It's a masterful performance. Hitler was a canny, canny person with a brilliant, brilliant sense of drama. He was a master of dark fire, that guy. Bernardo's behavior is amazing. Hitler's Table Talk is another amazing book. He's good-looking and he's charismatic. The reason that people like Hitler are attractive from the charismatic perspective, 
is that people do tend to admire those individuals courageous enough to act on their darker impulses. In addition to the language being similar, or identical, there's Peterson's giddy tone. When ladling out praise for Hitler and serial killers, he gets all manic or hot and bothered, and the praise comes in rapid succession. Finally, do you recall when Bernardo was asked if he killed Elizabeth Bain? After equivocating, he said, The answer to that is no, but the 800-pound gorilla in the room is that's a life 25-year sentence. This was another one of Bernardo's funnies, because he was already serving what he called a life 25-year sentence, with the chance of parole being approximately zero. In Canada, sentences run concurrently, not consecutively, meaning that if he were convicted of an additional murder, his sentence, to the best of my knowledge, wouldn't change. I imagine he knew this and was just clowning around. Also, in English, unless we are mixing metaphors, we don't say the 800-pound gorilla in the room, but rather the elephant in the room. The 800-pound gorilla is not a metaphor for a large or immediate problem that people wish to ignore, but an allusion to a group or individual that has so much power they can disregard the law. This allusion usually takes the form of a question and answer. Where does an 800-pound gorilla sit? Wherever it wants. Why am I telling you this? I'm coming to the point. Peterson's Pinocchio lecture was published in January 2017, or during the year he finished writing 12 Rules for Life, which was published in January 2018. Indeed, in his 2017 lectures, a lot of his commentary appears in 12 Rules. And within that book's covers, Peterson talks about our refusal to acknowledge the 800-pound gorilla in the room, the elephant under the carpet, the skeleton in the closet. Like Paul Bernardo, Professor Jordan Peterson mixed his metaphors, you'd think he'd know better, talking about an 800-pound gorilla in the room along with an elephant, or problem, under a carpet, as well as a skeleton. Now here's a passage from a book about Paul Bernardo by Peter Vronsky, describing the murder of Leslie Mahaffey. Bernardo entered the upstairs bedroom with a black electrical cord, wrapped it around Leslie's throat, and attempted to strangle her. It was not easy. Bernardo redoubled his effort until a pool of urine formed under Leslie as she died on the carpeted floor. Paul Bernardo and his accomplice, Carla Homolka, then hid Leslie Mahaffey's corpse in the basement because the next day, Carla's parents were coming to visit. After they left, Bernardo retrieved his power saw. A carpet also featured in the murder of Kristen French. After she was strangled, Bernardo became worried that carpet fibers might be present in her hair, hence why he wanted to cut off her hair before dumping her corpse outside the cemetery in which Leslie Mahaffey was buried. What I'm saying is this. I believe Peterson's reference to the 800-pound gorilla in the room, elephant under the carpet, and skeleton in the closet is a tribute to Paul Bernardo and his rape and murder of Leslie Mahaffey and Kristen French. It's part of a distinctive pattern, which is to say, he plagiarizes people he finds inspiring, typically psychopaths like Adolf Hitler and Friedrich Nietzsche. He can't help it. His mental illness compels him. Nearly all of the people he plagiarizes, he discusses and even cites. He's absolutely crackerjacks. I also found an instance of him plagiarizing the autobiography of Karl Panzram, which he has read. This bit of plagiarism occurs during a discussion of Karl Panzram. Like Bernardo, Panzram raped and murdered children. Peterson has routinely praised Nazis and said that he could have participated in the Holocaust as a Nazi camp guard with happiness. During the Holocaust, the Nazis murdered 1.5 million children. When Jordan Peterson feverishly lauds mass murderers, serial murderers, and serial rapists, he calculates that, given the subject matter, most people will not recognize his commendation or will explain it away. But he also calculates that some people people with psychopathy, antisocial personality disorder, schizophrenia, etc., will understand. They may even begin to fantasize, if they're not doing so already, about a bit of homicidal payback for whatever misfortune life served up to them. This is why Peterson told his students that they could probably identify with Raskolnikov while calling his female victim horrible. And it's why he said that Raskolnikov's homicidal fantasies were rationalistic, and insinuated that his students would love to do what Raskolnikov did, but were just too cowardly. So anyways, Raskolnikov is, he's thinking these sort of supermanish, rationalistic ideas, and he thinks, well, you know, there's no evidence that there's any real moral hierarchy. And you can easily make a case that the reason that people aren't really moral, they're just cowardly. 
and this is a Nietzschean observation, right? Most of what you call your morality isn't morality at all. It's just you're too afraid to do what you want, and because you're too weaselly to admit that, you say that you don't do those things because you're moral. But it isn't true. You'd love to do them if you were brave enough. You just aren't. Again and again, Peterson sympathizes and identifies with barbaric and bloodthirsty victimizers, criticizing the victims or drawing a veil over, and even joking about, their grisly fate. He depicts murderers as smart and brave, and tells his mostly male followers that they need to be smart and brave. Nay, heroes who must embark on a hero's journey and slay the dragon of chaos. This is not some harmless metaphor, it's code. He informs his followers that morality is cowardice, and compassion just a mask. Empathy is for two-year-olds, he thunders. He reminds pliable men of female rejection, think about what he said about Alec Manassian, and all of their suffering, bitterness, and resentment. He helps them channel their resentment, and then he tells them they need to emerge from the underworld and find a target and have an aim. Conveniently, he goes on to provide the targets that they ought to aim at. Women. For example, kindergarten teachers, professors, and journalists, and all those rabid harpies who contaminate the workplace. Also, there's the radical left, who are genocidal like Stalin, in addition to being Nazis, who, Peterson claims, drew inspiration from the left. National socialism, democratic socialism, these are identical, Peterson implies, before shifting gears and likening socialistic Scandinavia to dictatorial Venezuela. Another target is the media, especially the CBC. Damn them and their liberalism, multiculturalism, and egalitarianism. And let's not forget the government of Canada, who Peterson hates and likens to the Chinese Communist Party. Finally, Peterson's followers should target anyone who questions or criticizes him or labels his organization a cult. Sometimes he plays the role of a paramilitary leader. At other times, he acts like some sort of murder coach. His cult is a death cult, hence why he's been railing against the Canadian government for imposing health measures to protect citizens from COVID-19. Jordan Peterson has said that COVID is just like the flu, and held up his father's refusal to get vaccinated as an example for his fans. If he learned that just one person died after taking his advice, he would be over the moon. Once more, I do not make such claims lightly, nor do I do so to draw attention to myself. I make them as a public warning. Of course, you're under no obligation to believe me, but the only way to evaluate my claims is to examine the evidence. And what I've provided in this video is only a tiny fraction of the evidence. One last thing. If you were thinking that it wouldn't make sense for Peterson to pay tribute to Paul Bernardo by creating a reference virtually no one could decipher, I would disagree. The only person who has to understand what the reference signifies is Peterson. If no one figures it out, great. 12 Rules for Life has sold more than 5 million copies. That's 5 million dupes that Peterson has fooled. You, you can be fooled by a psychopath, and virtually anybody can. My name is Troy Parfit, and I'm the author of The Devil and His Do, How Jordan Peterson Plagiarizes Adolf Hitler. Thank you for watching and listening, and bye for now.